Historicism is the belief that was held by the majority of the Protestant reformers, including Martin Luther, John Calvin, Thomas Cranmer, and John Knox. Meanwhile, the Catholic Church tried to counter it with an alternate view, such as that put forward by the Jesuit Francisco Ribera during its Counter-Reformation. This alternate view served to bolster the Catholic Church position against Protestant criticism and as a Catholic defense against the historicist view, which identifies the Roman Church as a persecuting apostasy and the papacy as the seat of the Antichrist. Presently, most of the evangelical and Christian world believe some version of the futurist Catholic Counter-Reformation view of prophecy. The historicist interpretation reveals the entire course of history of the Church from the close of the first century to the end of time, which must necessarily be revised as new events and figures emerge on the world scene. This series is an up-to-date outline of the historicist view of the Revelation. Lecture 12. The Fifth Trumpet. Mohammed and the Saracens, A.D. 612 to 755. Revelation 9, 1 through 11. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days men shall seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle and their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle, and they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. We have already, in the preceding lecture, remarked the geographical propriety of the selection of the various symbols of scripture prophecy, serving as it does, in a great measure, to designate the particular country to which the vision points us. Sometimes the imagery is of that general character which belongs alike to every part of the world, but at other times a slight attention to the emblem will convince us that the same divine mind that has given to different lands their characteristic objects has expressly designed the introduction of those objects into the figurative descriptions of the prophecy in order to confine the application to its true locality. It is on these grounds that we are able at once to infer from the passage before us the identical country whence this woe was to have its rise. The agents and their commission to destroy and the particular individual also who was to constitute their prophet and leader. 1. First, as to the peculiar country and people whence it was to originate, 
the locust. The groundwork of the symbol is wholly Arabic. It was the east wind which brought the locust on Egypt, a statement distinctly pointing to Arabia as to the land upon the east of Egypt. The Syrians, we are told by Volney, have remarked that the locusts come constantly from the deserts of Arabia. The terms Arab and locust are in Hebrew almost the same. The symbol is elsewhere in the scripture used with like appropriateness. They, the Midianite Arabs, came as grasshoppers, meaning locusts. Great peculiarity attached to these monsters of the vision before us. They were half beast, half man. Their coming, like locusts, in destructive swarms is in accordance with the figure, but their shape was like horses. The horse was peculiarly Arabian and seems to indicate hordes of cavalry. They were, it is said, prepared for battle. They had teeth like irons, savage destroyers of life, and they resembled scorpions in their poison stings, implying that they would be the tormentors of those whose lives they spared. The scorpion is of the same native locality. Witness the words of Moses when reminding the Israelites of God's goodness to them throughout their forty years' wanderings. Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions? Thus the zoology is all Arabian. Next, as to the human appearance of these locusts, their faces like men, their hair as the hair of women. What people? could be thus pictured, neither to the Greeks and Romans, nor yet to their Gothic invaders. Will the whole of the test apply? The former have had repugnance in John's time to the feminine appearance of long hair and men, while the latter were remarkable, as is noticed by Jerome, for the unmanlike shaven smoothness of their faces. There was, however, a nation to which the whole of the descriptive symbol was literally applicable. Pliny, St. John's contemporary, speaks of the Arabs as wearing the turban, having their hair long and uncut, and with the mustache, too, on their upper lip, that venerable sign of manhood, as Gibbon calls it. In the Arabian poem, Antar, written about Mohammed's time, we find the beard and the mustache, the long flowing hair and turban, all specified as characterizing the appearance of the Arab. And the turban of the Arab was often noted as a crown. So Ezekiel spoke of Sabians, Arabs, from the desert with beautiful crowns upon their heads. One of their national proverbs also tells us that turbans were given by God to them instead of diadems. The breastplates of iron worn by these creatures are also noted in the vision. The Saracen policy was the wearing defense of armor, their coats of mail being repeatedly mentioned by historians. Thus on the whole, these concurrent symbols point to Arabia as the country whence the woe was to originate. And if we turn from prophecy to history, we find that, at the opening of the 7th century, the fact notoriously verifying the prediction, a mighty Saracen or Arab invasion is the chief event which it records. 2. But what of the abyss and out of which these locusts are said to have issued? The word is often used in the scripture with reference to hell, or the place of the departed wicked and in the New Testament it is likewise introduced as the deep, into which the devils entreated of our Lord that they might not be sent, and in the Revelation as the bottomless pit, where that old serpent the devil is bound. Moreover, as the natural light of the sun is a fit emblem of the spiritual illumination that comes down from the God and Father of lights, so may we infer that whatever is described as darkening the atmosphere, even as smoke from a pit, must be met in the opposite sense of a moral or spiritual pollution. The smoke then, in the apocalyptic vision, we consider to be an emanation from Satan issuing 
from the pit of hell, i.e. some system of false religion which should obscure truth or dim the light of heaven. And was it even so? Did it so happen at this particular juncture that such a system of pestilent error rose up? And if so, did it take its rise from Arabia? To these inquiries we reply, who has not heard of Mohammed, that false prophet, and of the spread of his too popular creed? This deadly evil came out from Arabia at the very time we speak of, a creed the invention of fanaticism and fraud. In its system the blessed God is described as cruel and unholy, and in its morals pride, ferocity, superstition, and sensuality are held up for admiration, and show palpably whence it had its origin. It was just after embracing Mohammed's principles that the Saracens, as locusts from the abyss, issued forth on Christendom. It was the adoption of this creed, the creed of Mohammed, that made them what they were, that united these hordes as one, that gave them the impulse to fly, locust-like, to propagate their faith over the world, and that imparted to them as to raging lions of the desert, their destructive fury of fanaticism. Their scorpion venom was thereby prepared to torment such of the Christians as they should bring under their yoke. While the hope of gross licentiousness to be indulged in both here and hereafter added sensuality to their ferocity, well does the Saracen history accord with the prophetic emblem concerning them. 3. We have to observe the peculiar nature of the commission, hurt not the grass or trees, but only the men who have not God's seal on their foreheads. Mohammed expressly declared that his mission was against idolaters, and such he considered Christians. But in urging forward his followers against them, the Caliph Abu Bakr did but fulfill the precept of the Prophet when he gave the command, destroy no palm trees, nor any fields of corn, cut down no fruit trees, nor do any mischief to cattle. It was the dictate of policy, not of mercy, for by following this plan, the Saracens had, soon after their conquest, formed flourishing countries around them. It was a marked peculiarity, for in other invasions as the Gothic, fire, sword, and devastation track the invader's progress, and was accordingly prefigured in the apocalyptic imagery, but with the Saracens it was the very reverse, and this reverse still more connects it with the prediction now before us. 4. We have so far identified this passage with the Arabian heresy and eruption that the interference we clearly deduce is that Mohammed was the star or ruler referred to. But why is this impostor mentioned as a star? And why, still more, since success followed his course for such a length of time, is he said to be a fallen star? To answer this, we must trace Mohammed's history back to his birth. His origin was princely, being descended from one of the noblest families in Arabia. Gibbon says, the grandfather of Mohammed and his lineal ancestors appeared in foreign and domestic transactions as the princes of their country. They were, in the view of the Syrian Greeks, as among the stars on the political horizon. But just after the prophet's birth, his father died, and soon after his grandfather. Then the governorship of Mecca, and the keys of Kaaba, or holy place of religion amongst the Arabians, attached to the office passed into another branch of the family. Thus Mohammed became a star fallen from power. He says of himself that at the opening of the seventh century he was a desolate orphan. He was indeed fallen when, as a poor widow's servant, he used to traffic in the markets of Damascus. 
Mohammed, however, was imbued with a spirit calculated to struggle against and triumph over misfortune. That was already stirring in his mind, which was to raise him far above a mere prince of Mecca. The scheme of reascending to the station he had lost by introducing a new system of superstition. About three miles from Mecca was a cave called Hera. It was a secret and desolate spot. There he withdrew every year to consult, as he said, a spirit who was wont to visit him in his solitary hours and hold converse with him. Gibbon well calls it the spirit of fraud and enthusiasm, whose abode was not in heaven, but in the mind of the prophet. This cave has aptly suggested to interpreters the idea of the pit of the abyss, whence the pestilential fumes and darkness were seen to issue. When privately at first, and then more publicly, he began to announce his creed. For a while his uncle and the elders of the city affected to despise the orphan's presumption. They chased him from Mecca, and his flight marks in history the era of the Hagira, A.D. 622. Seven years afterwards, he was seen in Mecca streets as one to whom all bowed down in honor, whose words the multitudes revered, to whose command armies were obedient, who swayed the minds of men that they yielded implicit faith to his wild or crafty imaginations. The fallen star had come forth again. The key of office was restored to him. The fugitive missionary was enthroned as the prince and the prophet of his native country. The key of God asserted in the Quran to have been given to Muhammad to open the gate of heaven to believers continued to be borne by his followers both as a religious and a national emblem and may still be seen sculptured on the proud gate of justice in Alhambra, or Palace of the Moors. Even so, in elusive contrast, it is written in the Revelation, the key of the abyss was given to him, and truly the smoke that arose upon his opening was the pestilential fumes and darkness of hell. Having thus endeavored to illustrate the suitableness of these emblems in the vision to the rise of Mohammedism and of the Moslem Arabs in the 7th century, let us follow on and try whether their subsequent history will verify the other intimations respecting them. There came locusts on the earth. It was in A.D. 629 that the Saracens first issued from the desert and proclaimed war against Christendom. The year 639 saw Syria subdued, and the muezzin call to prayer soon after sounded from a mosque built on the site of Solomon's temple. It can still be heard to this very day when the appointed hour comes for the remembering of the prophet. The subjugation of Egypt followed quickly on that of Syria, then some few years after that of the African provinces. Then, at the commencement of the 8th century, that of Spain, all this was within the limits of Roman Christendom, and consequently within the sphere of the apocalyptic vision. Even beyond, their conquests extend far and wide with terrible rapidity. Two short statements from history will give some idea of the progress of the Saracens and of the desolation caused by them, of whom it might be said, as was said of the desolating force mentioned in Joel, the land was as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. The one that in ten years, i.e. from A.D. 634 to 644, they had reduced 3,600 castles to ruin, destroyed 4,000 churches, and had built 1,400 mosques for the exercise of the religion of Mohammed. The other, at the end of the first century of the Hegira, the Arabian Empire had been extended from the confines of India and Tartary to the shores of the Atlantic. 
bitterly did the Christians feel the scorpion sting. They were deprived of the use of their arms and, like slaves of old, made to pay annually a life redemption tax. They were required to stand up always in the presence of their tyrants and were called by the names of opprobrium, such as infidel dog, Christian dog, etc. In further token of contempt of their religion, to which the Christians still clung with fond attachment, no new churches were permitted to be built, no church bell to be rung, while the scoffing Moslem had free access, even during divine worship, to all those which were allowed to exist. Insults of the grossest kind were continually offered to Christian females, and undefinable acts of oppression practiced on all. Every inducement was offered to apostasy, and the punishment of death was inflicted on any who, after apostasy, again professed the Christian faith. These locusts, it is said, had a king over them whose name was Abaddon, or the destroyer. Mohammed professed that the spirit of the cave had dictated to him the Koran. This was accordingly the law that governed the Saracens. The caliphs, or chief governors, held rule only as vicars of the false prophet. What the doctrine of the book was, as acted out by them, appeared on the field of battle. There, when we see not only the loss of bodily life resulting, but also the ruin of souls from the poisonous precepts of Islam, we cannot find more fitting title to express the perpetuation of the Prophet's character in each successive caliph than that of the Abaddon, the destroyer of Christians. There was, however, a term and limit prescribed to these locusts, both as to effect and as to duration, for observe, they were not to kill, i.e., to annihilate the men of Roman Christendom as a political body, but only to torment them. And this woe was to last 150 days, i.e., in prophetic language, 150 years. Vain, accordingly, were the Saracen efforts to destroy the state. Twice did they attack Constantinople, the capital of the Eastern Division, of the Roman Empire. They were defeated with ignominy and obliged to retire, the last of which repulses was in AD 718. Again in the West, when they sought to destroy Peleo and his band of Goths in the mountains of Asturias, they were twice driven back with disgrace, AD 711. Still more remarkably, when they attempted to subjugate France in 732, they suffered signal discomfiture from Charles Martel. Though he did not succeed in driving them from Provence and Lyon for 15 or 20 years. Still, though hindered from driving far their conquests, the locust swarm remained to torment and was united under one head. About the middle of the 8th century, However, a division took place among themselves. The caliphate was divided, one caliph being set up in the west and an opposing caliph in the east. The eastern caliph, resolving to build a new capital, laid the foundation of it at Baghdad, and thither the head of the locust tribe and the swarm took their flight. Once settled at Baghdad, the Saracens began to decline from the warlike spirit which had animated them. Gibbon says, the luxury of the caliphs relaxed the nerves and terminated the progress of the Arabian Empire. In the west, the son of Charles Martel drove back the Saracens beyond the Pyrenees, A.D. 755. Again in the year 761, the Christian remnant in Spain turned back the tide of war on their oppressors. The termination of the Saracen woe, at least in intensity, may date at this period, A.D. 762. Observe now what had been the length of time occupied in these transactions, 
we date from the period when Mohammed publicly announced his mission to propagate his religion by violence and with the sword, a mission which made his followers a woe to all countries, but especially to Christendom. The destroying commission might be said to commence at that period when Mohammed, addressing his assembled followers, inquired, Who will be my lieutenant? Ali, called by him the Lion of God, replied, O Prophet, I will be thy lieutenant. Whoever rises against thee, I will dash out his teeth, tear out his eyes, break his legs, rip him open. I am the man. I will be thy vizier. Mr. Hallam justly observes, these words of Mohammed's illustrious disciple are, as it were, a text upon which the commentary extends to the whole of Saracen history. Thus then reckoning from A.D. 612 to A.D. 762, when the caliphate was removed to Baghdad, we find the intervening period to be precisely 150 years. To several remarkable coincidences which occurred during this period, we should give attention. It has been observed that the apostasy of the church was the assigned and predicted cause of this judgment. Now Mohammed's asserted commission was specially directed against idolaters, and it was in that character as an idolatrous people that Christendom appeared when the Saracen woe fell upon it. Up to the close of the 7th century, the reproach of image worship might seem deservedly to give cause for the scourge which they suffered under the Moslem sword. But about the year 717, the Isaurian family ascended the throne of Constantinople. For 60 years, its princes, supported by many real Christians, though opposed by the popes and the masses of the people, resisted image worship and endeavored to overthrow it. Mark then, it was during this period of resistance to the error that the Saracen horde received its first defeat at Constantinople. Again in A.D. 754, Constantine Copronymus called a council in order to condemn the idolatrous image worship. It passed a solemn judgment against it, and behold, it was the very next year that the caliphate was divided, and the intensity of the Saracen woe was ended. But alas, the efforts of these emperors availed but little. In the year 781, the Queen Irene succeeded to the throne, having murdered her image-destroying husband. She convened what is called the Seventh General Council, and by a solemn act of the Catholic Church, the worship of images was declared lawful. Just then the Saracen woe seemed for a time to revive. The Arab forces swept through Asia Minor into Greece, again and again bearing down all before them. Was there in all this no warning from God? The Eastern Church, however, persisted. In A.D. 842, the struggle ended under the reign of the Empress Theodora, and image worship became indisputably established. Through the 9th and 10th centuries, it so continued, yet such was the long-suffering of God. No judgment seemed to follow, but the time of retribution came at last. Here we close as far as regards this vision. But a fact or two relative to the downfall of Saracen power may be added. Luxury, we have said, weakened its strength. In A.D. 841, the Caliph, distrusting his guards, was forced to hire a protective force of 50,000 Turks. These, like the Praetorian guards at Rome, in their turn became tyrants and accelerated the sinking of the Saracens. At Fez and Tunis, in Egypt and Syria, in Khorasan and Persia to the east, new and independent powers were formed. A third caliphate arose at Cairo. The Persians, in A.D. 934, stripped the caliph of Baghdad of all temporal power and left him only the title of 
pontiff of Islam. In the West, a century after, the Saracens were driven out, and though they continued as marauders and even gained victories in Crete and Sicily, the woe might be said to have passed from Christendom.